We want to welcome, of course, Newcastle and Meadville and Vernon Township. Next week, we go live at all at, at both of the, the new locations. Aren't you excited about the kingdom expanding and reaching people? What a privilege. God's doing some amazing things. I want to take some time today and, and share with you a message that is probably one of the most primary messages that you can understand as a Christian. For so many people, you know, having been a pastor for so many years, when you really get behind the scenes in the heart of an individual, most people push away from God for reasons that, that have nothing to do with who he is and everything to do with how we see him, how we perceive him, and it's not even true. I want to talk to you today about a, a simple s subject, a simple sentence, almost a statement that I want you to process with me. Has God called you to be a slave or a son and a daughter? What is, the, what is it that happens in the human heart with God where people begin to see him as someone they have to appease, almost like a slave or a master, rather than seeing him as a heavenly father and, and seeing yourself as a son or a daughter? Now, you may not have a background that gives you the privilege of seeing a father or a mother in a positive light. And, that's, and, and my heart breaks for that reason. But the reality of it is God is not your mother and father. He is righteous and he is holy and he is good. And I want to help you today to step into sonship, step into what it means to be a daughter of God, to step into that inside feeling. The other day I was just going through uh, uh, Michelle's Facebook page to get to mine. And, and I just popped up this little video of this little girl, she couldn't have been more than two years old, at the most three. And, and she was at the front door and her mom had pulled in, evidently like the mom had worked during the day and, and, and she was pulling in to pick her up. And you could see the little girl recognize the car as little as she was and she, her feet began to dance. And when her mom got out of the car, she started to spin and spin and dance and dance. And when her mom made eye contact with you, the joy on her mom's face, it was just this picture of this child so thrilled to see, their, to see her mom. And if, if Christians could grasp the reality that that's what Jesus died to provide, not just in our heart toward God, but more importantly, the way God sees you, that when he sees you coming, that it isn't this, I tolerate you, but this rejoicing. And when you grasp that, it changes everything. Listen to what Jesus said about this in John 15. Verse 9, and then we'll read verse 13 through 16. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he said this, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Now remain in my love. Now I want you to, Jesus didn't just say words for no reason. He simply is saying, listen, I've loved you just like the Father loves me, and you need to remain in this kind of love if you're going to be my disciple. Verse 13, he defines this love. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. You are now my friends since I have told you everything the Father has told me. I want you to grasp something about this is the Son of God. This is God in flesh. And he said, I've held nothing back from you. Most people see a relationship with God is what you have to do and what you have to stop doing. And both become negative. And Jesus said, I've come to reveal the Father to you. I've come to, for you to know that the love the Father has for me is the same that he has for you. I, I want you to understand how to abide in this love. I want you to understand that I don't see you as slaves, but as friends. Now, as friends in our mind, we think of like buddies. But that's not the word to, to the Jewish mind. The word friend is a covenant word. Abraham, the Bible said, was called the friend of God when he went into covenant with God. Jesus said, there's coming a covenant where I am going to join to you in such a way that everything that I am, everything I've revealed, all of who God is to you will be made available to everybody. The Jewish mind saw God as selecting, select individuals to which to reveal himself. Very often it would be through the prophet or the, the high priest or the king. And the common everyday Jew had no access to God. 
The common everyday Jew had no relationship with God that was intimate. And God became one that he had to obey other than one he could know. And I want you to see how simple it is, to be, depending on your religious background, to slip right back into that. Jesus said that I want you to abide in this kind of love. It's why we say it a thousand times over. This church exists to help all people, all people, all people love God, hate God, don't believe in God. This church exists to help all people realize that God loves them unconditionally. When you grasp the reality of the love of the Father, it changes the way you live your life. It changes going from that slave mentality and moving into being a son, moving into being a daughter, and it changes everything. Religion creates slaves, and it forces you to serve a master God. But Jesus came to bring freedom from that slavery to make you sons and daughters. We can only know God based on what we've seen of him. Now, I, I'm a, I was raised as a, a Catholic kid. As you can tell that I'm not Swedish. Most people of my descent, Italians, are, are, are Catholic. And so what I'm about to say is not derogatory. It's just my life as a kid. Now, and what I'm about to tell you, I was not taught as a Catholic kid. No one told me this. So don't, I, I don't want to infer that this was a teaching. It wasn't. But I remember at about eight or nine years old, a desire in me to know God was so real. I didn't know the scripture. I didn't know that you could come to Christ. I didn't know that Christ would come and live inside you and make you brand new. I didn't know those things. All I knew is there was a longing in me to somehow want to know God. And that's not unique to me. The book of Romans says that that, that that actually beats in every human heart on the planet. And usually, though, it gets filled with religion or legalism or some form of a picture or an image of God that men create in their own image to appease their own sin or to justify their lives or to somehow even punish themselves. And instead of God making man in his image, man makes a God in his image. And so I remember at eight or nine years old, there was something that was told to us as a kid that, it, that it would happen historically to people uh, throughout the centuries that God really loved. And, and, and it's called st the stigmata. And what that basically would be is that God would put the marks of the cross in somebody's body. This would be a very special person, a person that God had his hand upon. And, and, and they would get wounds in their hands and in their side and in their feet. And it was supposedly this supernatural thing that would happen. It was terribly painful, but it was what God did if you were special and that he loved you. Now, I want you to fathom as an eight or nine year old child wanting to know God, thinking this must be the way. But as an eight or nine year old, I don't want this. I, God, this would be a horrible thing. But if that's what it takes, imagine the twisted mind that sees God's love revealed to me by marring my body with the same marks that he put on a savior. There's only one redeemer. There's only one mediator, one between God and man, Jesus. And I'm not one of them. And I can remember going into our bedroom and, you know, there were five of us in two bedrooms. And so, and all the doors were broken because they were all boys. Anybody have boys? Every door was broken. Every wall had a perfect circle of the doorknob where the doorknob went through the wall. My father finally said, I'm not fixing anything until all of you salams grow up and leave the house. And those of you, maybe from my background, a salam is like calling you a hunk of salami, which actually is not such a bad thing. <laughs> and so I remember going into the middle room where I slept, and I would have loved some privacy, but that didn't exist. I closed the door, I crawled up on the bed, and I began to pray, and I, the best I knew how. And I said, God, if that's, if that's how you have to know you, then do that to me. And, I, and, and part of me is hoping he doesn't, because that's going to hurt. I hate pain. I still hate pain. I don't even like stubbing my toe. How many of you know it's all the devil? Pain, I hate it. Especially unnecessary pain, but I'm thinking that this is what it takes. Now, of course, nothing happened. And down deep in my soul, I thought, I guess I can't know you like other, like those people that, that were special to you. See, the old covenant created the mindset in men and women that the only way to know God is if he selected you. Otherwise, you were just part of the crowd. 
And religion pours that into the soul of every man and woman to this day. So I will me tell you that we exist to help all people, all people realize God loves them unconditionally. It's why it is so resident in my heart. It changed my life to discover the love of God. And when we tell you there's four things that you should experience, that we want you to know God. We want you to find freedom, discover your purpose and make an impact. Those aren't just words. We mean know God with an intimacy of a child knowing a parent and a freedom that comes from only knowing him more than you know your past and all the things that have shaped what you believe about your life. And when you know God and begin to find the freedom that's in Christ, only then can you discover the real reason you've been put on planet Earth. Everything else, everything else is just a spinning in circles. I don't care what you achieve. I don't care what accolades you, you gain, how much money you make. Until you know God and you've experienced the freedom that Jesus provides, you will never live in your purpose. And, you, and the more you achieve, the emptier you'll get. But the reality of it is, is that God designed you for a unique purpose. And then he designed that purpose to make an impact beyond your life. Every person was designed to live this way. And yet so easily we get trapped. We get sucked into the vortex of trying to somehow make God love us. Somehow, God, what do I have to do to have you help me? What do I have to do to make these parts of my life that, are, that I know you don't like, that I don't like? If they don't go away, I guess you'll never. And before long, religion separates you from an intimacy with God. But there was an old covenant and a new covenant. And the declaration, the scripture said, of the, of the new covenant would be this, that everybody can know God intimately. Everybody. Now, to, to your mind, perhaps, because of being raised in a biblical environment for, for many of you, that, that may not be such a shock. But to the Jewish mind, when he said, everybody, everybody can know me intimately, it was like it was an impossibility. How could it be? Let me take you into the scripture so you can learn this for yourself. And when you discover these truths, it is the easiest thing to tell other people this story. Most people don't tell others about Christ because they don't know what to tell. They don't understand how simple this is. Look at Hebrews chapter uh, 8, uh, and I'll start in verse 7. Scripture said, if the first covenant, referring to the law of Moses, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when, but when God found fault with the people, he said, the day is coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one that is the law I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. This was the law given through Moses. And they did not remain faithful to my covenant, the law. So I turned my back on them, said the Lord. But this is the new covenant. Now, this is the new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. Listen, I will put my laws in their individual minds. I will write them on their individual hearts. Now, listen, and I will be their God possessed of them. And they will be my people possessed of me. And you will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach all their relatives and say, you should know the Lord. Listen now. For everyone, say out loud, everyone. For everyone who comes under this covenant through Christ. For everyone from the least to the greatest will already know me. And I will forgive their sins and wickedness. And I will never again remember your sins. People don't understand that's the goodness of God. He said that when I rescue you, the old covenant could not rescue you. The law of God was not designed to produce righteousness. But Jesus said there was coming a day when you will know me so intimately. And I will deal with this thing that sin that separated you. And your past will not only be gone, but I will forget everything you ever did. How many of you know God is called the ancient of days? That doesn't mean he's old and forgetful. It means that a price would be paid. Listen, here's the amazing. There's nothing behind you. And when you come to Christ and walk with him, that God will ever bring up to you again, ever. Imagine every day of the world, a clean slate. 
because of a savior. Most people don't live that way. Religion doesn't let us. It keeps us trapped into our past. And what it results in is this separation between God and man. A separation that Jesus died to change. The fault in the law, and there was a fault in the law, was that it could not produce righteousness in those who tried to follow it. The law, the Bible said, is holy. There's nothing wrong with the law of God. 610 laws. But the law of God was never designed to make you right with God. The law of God was designed to teach you something. The law of God was designed to teach me something. In fact, let me read it to you out of the book of Galatians. In fact, the Bible calls the law a tutor. Everybody say tutor. Now, some of you are like really good at school. You know, you're the ones that like got the A's and all that good stuff. People like me tried to sit beside. Anybody like me? Hey, remember, top half of the class means nothing without people like me. Just so you know, you stand on my shoulders. All right. I was in the top 10 percent. Not without me, you weren't. Just 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 laying that out there. But I could use me some tutoring. Math just, I was decent at math until they threw the numbers in and the letters together. And I was like, a, a tutor can help you if you're, if you're helpable. But the law the Bible actually said is to come and to bring you somewhere that you can't get without it. It's to tutor you. Listen, Galatians 3, 21. Is, is the law therefore... Opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life or eternal life, so important, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. All righteousness is is right standing with God. The ability to stand before God without the sense of sin consciousness. He said the law could not provide that. If it could, it would have, but it couldn't. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe before this faith came. Now, listen, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge, listen, as a tutor or a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. That we might be made righteous by faith. Now that faith has come. We are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all, say it out loud, all. You are all now sons and daughters through faith in Christ Jesus. You are now a child of God. Here's what the law was designed to do. Sometimes I'll hear people quote the law to justify certain behaviors and practices and sins. And they'll say, well, you know, the law says that you can't mix these two types of cloth. And they're right. And this was the penalty for doing this nonsensical thing. Didn't make any sense. The law was so intricate. We're not keeping all of those laws, are we? And in their ignorance, they think the law of God was designed to make you right with God. It was not. The law of God was designed to show you that no human being could earn their righteousness. That no human being could keep every law of God because only a righteous person could do that without fail. And the scripture said that if you fail in one of the 610, you become guilty of all. All have been prisoners, slaved by sin, under the burden of law because the law said no one is righteous, not even one. And so if you try to make yourself righteous, through obedience to the law, it will trap you and push you away from God for one reason. Here's what it was designed to do, to bring you to a place of helplessness and say, I need a savior. I can't do this on my own. I can't make myself right. And the law was designed because the law is holy and good. But it was designed to tutor you like in math. Say, that's what that letter, it, that's what that letter's there for, John. It means something. When they stick an X in there, they didn't make a mistake. And, they, and it can help you understand. The law was simply there to teach every human being on planet Earth that you cannot make yourself right with God. 
You can't not do it. It was there to lead you to a savior, to take you from being a slave to your, to your sin stain, to being a son and a daughter. He goes on to say in Galatians 4, in, in verse 4, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. That means, remember now, listen, Jesus, just so you know, kept the law, never failed in one part of the law and remained righteous. He's the only one who ever kept the law. That's why he could be crucified in your place and in my place, because he never tasted sin. It, there was no right to kill him or to punish him. So the punishment he bore on that tree was for me. That's why the scripture said, Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law because he became the curse for you because it's written, cursed is everyone who has hung on that tree so that the blessing of Abraham might come on those who don't know God, the Gentiles, that you might receive the promise the Holy Spirit made through faith. And if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and an heir according to that promise. I want you to see the, the amazing nature of God that he said there's a way where you can live as a son and a daughter. Galatians 4, verse 4, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. All of us, no one escapes this. So that he could adopt us, listen, as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into your very hearts. Listen, this is what it's supposed to do, to create this intimacy that prompts you to cry out, Abba, Father. When you see the word Abba left in most translations, it's a, it's a word in the Greek for, for, for Father. But it's left there because there is no vernacular in most languages to, to, to speak of the intimacy of the word Abba. The closest thing that I have in my, my relationship with my kids is the word Daddy particularly with my daughters. There's something about that word that when they say, Daddy, I love you. I, I, I honestly, I mean this sincerely. I, my knees go weak. It does something to my soul. It's an intimate word. It's a, it, it, when Jesus raised up the little girl who was risen from the dead, it, 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 they left the Greek word in that translation. And it, it's, it, it means my little flower, my little damsel. He spoke so intimately. Sin wants to separate you from intimacy with God. Even if you've given your life to Christ, it wants to trap you into a world where you can't walk with God in everyday life. That you get stuck in the difficulties of life, even the sins of your life. And he said that he would adopt us as his very own children. Because we are his children, God sent his spirit into, of his son into our hearts, prompting us to cry out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. What if you believe that? What if you believe that he loved you so intimately that Jesus would look at you today and say, I don't call you slaves. I don't call you slaves to sin. I redeem you. I bring you into my very own soul. I make you brand new. And I reveal everything to you. I, I put my spirit in you that you cry out, Abba, Father. And God of the universe is now your father. And as such, he's made you his heir. What has to happen for an heir to receive their inheritance? Someone has to die. Jesus died. And then he rose from the dead to enforce his own will. In fact, he's called the testator of his own will. When a person dies, they usually leave their will in the hands of someone they trust to be the executor of their will. Jesus died, rose from the dead. You and I, we are heirs of God, joint heirs of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he said. And then he rose from the dead and didn't leave it in the hands of angels or good or, or not so good or wonderful men or not so wonderful women or men. But Jesus rose from the dead himself to enforce his will. What if it were true that he loved you so intimately 
that nothing should define you but who he says you are. What if this love and this sacrifice was powerful enough to erase the consciousness of sin from your past to where you said, Abba, Father, Daddy, that you were that little girl waiting for her mom to come up the driveway. When you think of God, your feet start to dance. Instead of your heart palpitate, oh God, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'll change, I'll stop. I, 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 Most people think of God and their hearts shrink, even Christians, because they don't know his love. And when you understand this unimaginable love, it changes everything. It gives you access to the very throne of God, to walk by faith and not by sight, to receive of God's promises, to receive the healing power of God, direction from God, the Holy Spirit to guide you, lead you, direct you. And you don't have to pry it out of your father's hands. He freely gives all oh, the love of God. I want you to grasp the everyday language that the scripture is saying that is so contrary to the Jewish mind. If any man, the scripture said, any person comes to Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When anyone, say out loud, anyone. Listen, you're in anyone, I'm in anyone. Anyone, anyone, I don't care what you've done, who you did it with, how long you did it, you could get up and curse God to his face for 50 years straight. On the day you bow your knee to Jesus, anyone, this is you. If anyone, anyone, anyone is joined to Christ, he is a new being, a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Now listen, all this is done by whom? Say that loud. By God, not you. The law tells you to do it. The law says I have to stop this and, and start that. And what the law did for most people is it drove them, if they let the law do its job, to helplessness and to a savior. Now listen, the minute you put yourself back under law, trying to make God love you and be righteous based on you, it will drive you away from God all over again. Because it is designed to drive you to a savior, not to you. Self-righteousness is deadly. I'm not telling you that we can't live for God. Oh, we can, but not by human strength. If any man, if anyone is joined to Christ, he's a new being, a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. All this is done by God who through Christ, listen, changed us from enemies to his friends. Gave us the privilege, now listen, of making others his friends also. That's your job and my privilege as a Christian. Our message as a Christian is this. This is the news that's so simple to tell. That God was reconciling the world in Christ, to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he's committed to those of us that have been rescued. This message of restoring man to divine favor. Now, now listen, here we are. His ambassadors. What if you saw yourself as an ambassador for Christ? The prestige of an ambassador from a nation to another nation. What if you saw yourself as his ambassador? His direct representative to tell and literally to speak for Christ, the scripture said, as though God himself were making his appeal through you. And here's your appeal. I plead on Christ's behalf. Let God change you from enemies into his friends and be reconciled to him. For God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we might become the very righteousness of God in him. What if that's true? And it is. What if the great exchange of him taking your sin and Jesus giving you righteousness when you made him the Lord of your life is all God and nothing to do with you except bowing your knee to a Savior and discovering who you are in him, a new identity. Satan's a great identity thief. People get all worked up if someone steals their credit cards. He wants to steal your life. He wants to steal your sonship and your daughter's heart of God toward God and turn you back in to a slave and to lie to you about your heavenly father. Jesus said, I keep nothing back from you. I keep nothing back from you. This is the privilege of every believer to tell this story to other people. 
It's the easiest thing in the world to give good news. Everybody likes to give good news. If you got to go into the room with everybody where you work and found out that everybody's getting 100% raise and you get to tell the, the good news, anybody going, oh, I don't want to tell that. This is better than that. This is telling everybody, I don't care what you've done, who you've done it with, if, you will, if you'll simply understand, he died for you. So that, and, and he literally paid a price so that if you give your life to him, he takes your sin and exchanges to you his righteousness. And you become a child of God. And you can walk with God in everyday life. No more shame. Most people live their whole life under the burden of shame and guilt. Shame says there's something innately wrong with me. Shame comes because of things that you've done or things that were done to you. And Jesus wants to strip away every ounce of shame that comes to you by your own failures and even the assaults and failures of other people. Shame is a prison that Jesus came to rescue you from. Hebrews 2.11 says this. So now Jesus, I love this. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy, that's you and me, have the same father. How can God help us. Holy Spirit, teach us to see this, that this isn't, these won't be mere words for people, but that the Holy Spirit himself, the teacher, will drive this into the heart of every hearer. That Jesus and the ones that he made holy, that he made holy and righteous, have the same father. And the scripture said, and that's why Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brothers and sisters. On your worst day, as you walk and walk toward God, he's not ashamed of you. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. Can you imagine how easy it is to tell that story to anybody that doesn't know God? Because most people see God as the law as that, that, that harsh hammer. When Jesus said, I've come to rescue you from the tyranny of being unable to earn your righteousness with God. You are no longer a slave, but you are a son and a daughter. And you have been enlisted by God himself, the maker of the universe, to stand in this earth realm and to represent him and go tell this good news. And to the degree I yield to God and tell that good news is to the degree I choose to work in the family business. Let me close with this. So many people hunger and thirst for so much from God in a broken and desperate world. Because this world's broken and it's desperate. And I need help and I imagine you need some too. And people are so busy trying to get God and figure out ways to get God into their problem instead of realizing that God's called you into a family business. And he said, when you put my family business first or my kingdom first, all the things that everyone else is screaming and needing, I will add those to you. It comes with the business. Listen, listen. As an Italian, my background, we joke a lot about being in the family. This is a good family. This doesn't have a God father. It has a father God. Come on, man. Do you understand? You are sons and daughters of the living God called in the family business. You want to know what the family business is called for you that are in it? It's called the genetic lottery. Bill Gates' kids hit the genetic lottery. All they did was get born, baby. And that's all you did was come to Christ and born of the Spirit of God. You become a son and daughter of the living God and you are in the family. And everything that belongs to the Son belongs to you because you are an heir of God. Man, what an amazing way to live. That's who you're called to be. That's what defines you. In Christ, every one of us are sons and daughters. Every one of us have God's Spirit within us. And every one of us know him intimately. Every one of us are called righteous in him and a new creation. That's who you are. That's who you are. Let me pray for every one of you. It's so important for every person under the sound of my voice to have the opportunity to give their life 
to the one that gave their life for them. You can't earn your salvation. I've asked more people than I can remember. When do you die? Where do you want to go? Most people say, well, if there's a heaven, I want to go there. And I say, well, how do you get there? Nine times out of 10, they say, well, if it exists, I guess I have to be good enough to get there. Well, tell me what is good enough. And they do this. Well, you know, better than most. Like, you know, if you weighed the, like, I, you know, that'd be better than like the, the average kind of person. And yet if you die in the burden of your sin, trying to earn your heaven because of trying to be better than most, it's not good enough because there are none righteous. Jesus, the scripture said, not even one. All of us are now held bondage and prisoners of the law. But there is a way for every human being to be free from the bondage of the stain of sin that we've all tasted. And that's why bowing your knee to the one who was sinless when he was born of a virgin, who rose and lived 30 years and never failed in one aspect of the law. And the innocent, spotless Son of God, all God, all man, was hung on the altar of a cross. And every bit of the wrath of God that was due me for my sin and due you was poured out on him. God judged me guilty and then he came himself to bear my penalty. What kind of love is this? And all an individual has to do is to acknowledge they need a savior and to bow their knee as it were to Christ and receive him into their life and now walk with him in everyday life in your new identity. And you're a new creation. This is available to every human being, no matter what they've done and where they've been, whether you're here online, whether you're watching on a screen, whether you're in the room. Eternity comes for all of us. And between you and eternity is a decision to pay the debt for your own sin by being separated from God forever or to receive the payment of a Savior who loved you. What kind of love is this? That's the message of the gospel. That's the good news of Christ. So if you want to pray with me today, whether you're here, whether you're online, wherever you might be, and you want to receive Christ into your life, to ask him to come to be the Lord and the Savior of your life, to acknowledge that you need a Savior and to receive his forgiveness and receive his sacrifice. Isn't it amazing the scripture said he turns no one away? It's, av it's available for all. So if you would say to me, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. I I'll do it right where you're at, whether you're online, wherever you are. Say, I want you to pray for me. Please include me in that prayer. If you desire to be included in that prayer, right, would you just simply raise your hand? Do it right now. Do it right now so I could pray for you. Heaven is so, so important. Eternity hangs in the balance for people. If you desire to receive Christ into your life, say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer right where you're at. Just go ahead and lift your hand so I can see it. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Go ahead and give a hand to those who, who raised their hand to receive Jesus. Best decision of your life. You know, if you raised your hand or you should have, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And when you pray this prayer, this isn't some dead religious prayer. You're inviting the living son of God to come into your life. Listen, listen, he turns no one away. It includes you. You're about to step into what's called eternal life free forever of your sin debt because of Jesus. Pray this out loud where you hear it and we'll pray it together with you. And Jesus will be the Lord and the Savior of your life. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father. Now pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you through Jesus Christ, the one who died for my sins. I have tasted the stain of sin and I cannot save myself. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin debt. I open the door of my heart and life. And Jesus, I receive you now to be the Lord of my life and to save me from my sin. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for making me a brand new creation. I am now a child of God. 
I'm no longer a slave to sin. God is my father. When I die, I am heaven bound because of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, man. Best decision of your life.